Yeah, so so welcome everyone to uh, to this workshop that we we organize through our, our project, <laughs> working towards an affordable perovskite powered um, solar pump for, for farms in Ethiopia. Um, I will just be sharing some of the the best practices and solar cell research that we've learned over the years, um, which I hope you'll find interesting. Um, so first we'll we'll have Sam talking a bit about the current state of solar. Uh, PV technologies and, and their operating principles. Um, then Chris will, will talk about a uh, real and simulated solar spectra, um, followed by Yushan, uh, sort of about how to use, uh, to use mass in these solar cells and the importance of getting that right. And then um, I'll be up last to just give a, a, a tutorial of the, the setup that, that we've built and that we'll ship to you uh, in the next week or so. Um, so yeah, let's get started with Sam. Yep. I'm gonna share your screen. Uh, share. What are you seeing now? Yeah. What's it? Is it full screen or is it? It's, I think you can see it. Sorry? It's full screen. Yeah. It is full screen? I think you need to swap your display, right. Sam. Okay. You need yeah. to swap your display. Uh, yeah. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Looks good now. Looks good. Good. Um, okay. And can you see my mouse? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. Okay. Well, if, if it's dropped out, if the mouse dropped out, just let me know. Uh, good. Well, thank you very much for coming on. Hopefully, this will be a useful uh, intro to uh, PV technologies and where we are today in terms of solar around the world. Uh, so, I, I want to start with just, I suppose, painting the picture of how much potential PV has to power to power everything we need, really. Um, so, this cube represents how much sunlight's hitting the Earth uh, at any one time. And this is our global power demand. So you can see there's huge potential for solar to provide everything we need. Uh, and when we compare to what we currently have, in fact, that maybe should increase now to close to a terawatt, which is really exciting in terms of how much we have, but you can just see how much there still is to go in terms of how much PV we need to deploy. So we're somewhere around the terawatt, we, we need to get to something on the order of 10 terawatts uh, and as quickly as possible. So we do have a long way to go, but there is huge potential. Uh, and so the cost of PV is already competitive in many places. So we're seeing the cost of um, Cost of PV going down dramatically, and this is uh, you can see that already. So in, in, in the levelized cost of electricity, for example, which is something that can um, tell us about essentially through the, the life of the of the energy source or the energy system and how much power it can produce. So this is a plot. This is from the US, just for one example at least of different um, energy technologies and looking at the levelized cost of electricity. And you can see so um, some of the traditional sort of coal and gas are obviously on the cheaper end. And there's, it's quite complex, some of the subsidies and other things that go into those. But then when you start looking at solar, you can see particularly when we start moving towards PV at utility scale, solar is, is already competitive, uh, which is very exciting. And that's something that really um, has driven this um, the, the massive deployment, at least in part driven the massive deployment of solar recently. So then really the lower the cost that we can make solar PV, the more it can contribute to energy solutions and, and decarbonization in particular. Um, as a caveat to this, of course, and something I'm not going to talk so much today about is that um, the LCOE doesn't account for intermittency. So not counting for the fact that the, the sun doesn't shine all the time, we do need other sources to complement, um, or we need storage solutions to come online. Um, and so the, the other thing, of course, is that PV will be a critical part of our energy solutions and for decarbonization. When you look at any any climate model or any of the reports coming out, for example, from the International Energy Agency or the IPCC, uh, all of these have PV as one of the, the really the dominant source of electricity generation. Um, and, and many of them, you know, this sort of 50% plus is from PV. Uh, and so this is this is showing the, the carbon intensity of different energy sources. So we can see there's the throughout the life cycle of these technologies, the carbon intensity again for the different technologies and it's no surprise to see that coal is, of course, a very carbon intensive technology. Um, and as we move towards to, towards other sources, we get um, a lot lower 
carbon intensity. And when you look at PV, of course, that is a very low carbon intensity. There, there is some carbon uh, involved with generating the PV panels, particularly the, the current silicon panels, but really over the lifetime of, of, of energy generation, this is actually quite a small fraction. Uh, interestingly, hydro is a very has a very big error bar on it, and that's because it depends whether you have hydro, whether you produced it as uh, uh, from natural hydro or whether, whether you're reclaiming and, and artificially making um, hydro dams, which have quite a lot of carbon intensity associated with biomass, for example, and, and, and decay from biomass. Uh, so PV, there's, there's a huge uh, opportunity to decarbonize electricity, and we can think about that we can actually power the whole world with PV if we cover either an area of Spain or 1.2% um, land area of the Sahara Desert. We could, in principle, power the entire world. So that really puts in perspective just, you know, even if we distribute those PV panels around the world, that we don't actually need that much space, and we, 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 we could certainly do it. Um, there are lots of other benefits of PV, so public health benefits, much better air quality in many places. So just one example again in the US is by um, that if we if we had 27% of PV generated uh, generating our electricity by 2050, this would already give 167 billion dollars in health benefits and save 60,000 lives alone. And that's just in the US. US, and that will of course be um, when you think across the world, there'll be huge numbers of um, health benefits. Uh, you can also think about energy security and equality, and this is something particularly interesting at the moment with, of course, energy security being a very hot topic. That um, it, it really does alleviate a lot of issues that are, that are playing current energy technologies. Um, in terms of equality, when you average across the year, the, the sunniest country, so Azerbaijan, for example, um, it only it gets a factor of four times more sunlight than the cloudiest uh, country, which is Norway. So this discrepancy is not much actually between those with the the, the richest resource of, of solar and those with the poorest. And uh, if you compare that, for example, to uranium, it's a thousand times variation from those with the richest deposits and those with the, the poorest. Uh, and oil is a, it's a million times from the richest versus the poorest. So there's um, much more equality in terms of it, it, in solar. And it's usually generally those, the lower GDP countries, in fact, get a more resource rich in solar. They get more sunlight on average than, uh, than some of the richer countries. And the good news is solar deployment is growing very fast. We're seeing a rapid deployment in PV, uh, which is fantastic. It's what we need to, to be on track, or at least nominally on track for, for decarbonization goals. This is a plot that shows uh, the, the cumulative deployed solar PV um, across the years, across the decades. And so these dashed lines, or, or the data points, so, so the, the dashed lines here show the project, projections that the International Energy Agency makes each year on how much PV will be deployed. Uh, and it's every year after year, they continually underestimate how much PV is deployed. So these are the, the, the black symbols here of what's actually observed and deployed. You can see every year these projections are vastly under predicting what actually would be uh, predict uh, what would actually be deployed. And that, that trend has continued. This data goes up to 2018, but we're still seeing that happening today. Um, so we're, we're deploying more than we could we, we, we could at least, at least predict. Uh, and this is driven primarily from cost reductions so we've seen huge cost reductions in pv so if you think about the pv module prices so the, the cost per watt um, of, of the uh, of the power generated in the, in the panels this has dropped a factor of 100 since 1980 and another factor of 10 since 2010 which is really staggering if you think about um, some, you know such a cost reduction and this is really being driven by cost reductions in raw materials and manufacturing so as PV as the volume goes up, economies of scale kick in, so everything does come down in cost. Uh, and also power conversion efficiency gains. So there has been improvements over the years consistently over the decades in the in the PV technologies and the efficiencies. And this has again led to um, cost reductions because each panel is producing more power. The, so the, the current PV technologies, which is I'll get on to in a few moments, which is the silicon. There are limitations though, so it is being deployed fast, but it's not going to be the technology that can get us there alone, at least towards these, these, these sort of 10 terawatt scale that we need. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons for that. One is that the, the non-module costs remain high. So there is the PV panel that you can buy, but then there's, there's also all of the infrastructure behind that panel, the installation, the wiring, uh, the inverter systems as well. These are the balance of systems costs. And what we see is that the module cost has come down 
dramatically. This is some data from, from Germany, and in fact, this, this module cost has continued to come down since this last data point in 2016. Um, but the balance of systems cost, these other costs, all the other the wiring and installation and so on, this has remained steady. And in fact, now that is really dominating a PV system, the cost of the PV system. And so this is much harder to make inroads into these costs. Um, one particularly important way is, is through efficiency. So if you can make each PV system more efficient, then this cost per watt will come down. Um, so it really motivates trying to make much more efficient panels. I'll get onto that uh, in a few moments. Uh, and the other issue is, is the high temperature processing of many of the conventional sort of silicon technologies. Uh, this means it's high capex in building, so in terms of building factories, it's a big investment. Uh, so it means it limits how fast we can build factories to, to make panels. Um, and also the, because of high temperature processing, there is a reasonable energy cost in processing these panels. So this does limit the rate of deployment uh, and also the applications that one can use PV for. They're typically panels that are bulky and rigid um, and, and they're best suited for rooftop installation or, or utility scale installation. In solar farms, you can't use them for, for, for other applications. Um, so this really shows that we do need to, uh, we can't rest on the current technology, we do need to keep innovating towards solutions with higher efficiency and more modularity and, and reduced costs in particular. And this is some of the work that, that we and many others are working on. I'm not going to go so much into that today. I'm, I'm mainly giving it an overview and perspective of, of where PV is. Um, so if we, if we think about unpacking a panel and think about what, what the PV system looks like and particularly the, the, the module itself, uh, so most of the market is crystalline silicon. So 95% of, 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 uh, of, of the market is, is made of these crystalline silicon technologies. And what that typically they're, they're made from silicon ingots, which um, uh, and, and, and silicon wafers that are cut to make cells. And these cells are strung together to make modules. And then these modules are, are hooked up together to make a solar array. And so these are the typical panels you see on rooftops or in, in solar farms. And they're very widespread. It's a very good technology. It's been uh, honed over decades and it's now very stable and, and a very efficient technology. Uh, there's another form where one can actually, instead of using ingots, you can actually deposit in fill in the monolithic form. So having a, a module that's deposited all as one layer. Um, and this is typically what um, the, these thin film technologies use, which is some different technologies. Uh, Again, these modules can then be strung together in arrays in, in, in a similar way. Uh, and when you when you look at one of these panels and, and unpack it, these cells and, and uh, that are strung together, they need to be encapsulated. So typically, there's um, uh, they, they've got um, glass glass encapsulation uh, or glass that's on the top to protect the cells. They need to last for many years, so this is quite important. Um, there's encapsulation involved in that as well, uh, and there's also a back sheet in the frame as well to, to, um, uh, to, to keep it uh, uh, rigid. And then these are typically put and racked into panels on, on rooftop, for, uh, racked into arrays on rooftops. Um, so in terms of how the panel works and, and how, how solar cell works, and it's most basic, what we have is some absorber layer that uh, is, is the solar absorber layer that will absorb light really well and we want to optimize that to absorb as much sunlight as possible. And so that's that absorber layer is effectively sandwiched between, between electrodes. So when we shine light in the, on the solar cell, uh, we generate, we energize electrons and, and we also energize holes, which are essentially a particle themselves, the absence of an electron. And then these electrons and holes are, um, are, are, are transported to these electrodes and then collected as current. So we generate, uh, with that, we, we generate a photocurrent from these electrons and holes. And because we're also separating these charges, we generate a photovoltage. And so the combination of the, the photocurrent and photovoltage uh, generate power. And so we can drive, for example, an external circuit. Uh, and so we, when we need to think about the operation of these panels, we think about semiconductors in particular. So these, we, we can think about materials as either it be the metals or uh, or semiconductors, where there's a where there's a gap between the valence band and the conduction band, and um, this means when we, we we can energize charges across the band gap by <clears throat> absorbing light, and these charges then are free to move in the conduction band and allows us to transport them. <clears throat> so typically, we we need a semiconductor to uh, to generate these um, 
to, 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 <clears throat> to be the active layer of these materials. We also need to think about um, there's a Fermi level which essentially tells us where um, the, the probability of where electron lies in these in these systems. And for an intrinsic semiconductor, this is this Fermi level lies somewhere in the middle where most of the electrons sit in this valence band. And at, and at some temperature, we may have some, some electrons promoted to the conduction band. But we can also have other systems where we where we intentionally add extra electrons to the system. So we don't the semiconductor. And so here we, we may have extra states that, that, that contribute charges. So these are, for example, donor states where there's extra electrons that add into the system. And this actually raises the Fermi level up towards the conduction band, for example. And that's called an N-type semiconductor. When we do that with electrons, we can also do that with holes and have donor or, or the acceptor states in this case for electrons, but essentially um, provide extra holes to the system. And that's a P-type semiconductor. And the reason that's important is because for a typical solar cell, and particularly silicon solar cells, for example, um, or in fact, many of them work for this operating principle is that we, we bring together a P-type and N-type semiconductor to, to be the active layer and, and the active component of the cell. So when we have a, a P-type and N-type semiconductor, we bring them together, they have Fermi levels, the P-types um, has a Fermi level, which is, uh, or chemical potential, which is near the valence band and the N-type has one that's near the conduction band. When we bring them together, what happens is electrons flow between the two materials until they reach equilibrium where the Fermi levels align. And what happens is we get this, what's called a PN junction forming at that interface. And so what we have here is the P-type material, the N-type material, and because we've had electrons flowing uh, from the N-type across to the P-type, what that leaves is it leaves behind some positive, positive cores or positive ions. And on the other side, we have negative ions. And what this, what this sets up is an electric field between these uh, across this region here. This is called the depletion region of, of, uh, of this junction. And the reason that's important is because this allows us to, to actually, this field allows us to separate the charges, these electrons and holes across this interface. So if we, if we think about this, the operating principle, so this is step through what, what happens. So if we, if we photo excite our, our um, charges here, so if we, we and this is photo generation is step one. So we excite electrons to the conduction band, leaving a hole in the, in the valence band. And then uh, an electron hitting this junction here will be swept across it and moving and will move across to the N-type material while the hole will be swept the other way and remain in, in the P-type material. And so this is a carrier drift where we have charges moving under a field and separating this way. Uh, we also have other things that will happen. These, these charges will also recombine and that, that will start, they'll start recombining from, uh, from, from as soon as they're generated essentially. And we can have recom recombination that's radiative, for example. So this means that an electron in the hole will recombine and emit light. And that's an inevitable process. We can't get around that. There'll be some fraction of that happening. And, um, and that's in some ways, um, a good process. The process that we don't want is, is carrier trapping. So what we can have is an electron can move along uh, and hit the trap and fall into a trap and, and, and then it will lose its energy to heat and recombine losing its energy to heat. That's an unwanted process and that's something that will reduce the, uh, the efficiency of the panel. And that's something that's not intrinsic, something we can get rid of in principle by removing defects and, and traps um, that, can, that can cause these processes. Uh, and so, yeah, so this, these are the processes that compete with this charge collection process. Uh, in terms of general considerations, I know uh, Krish will speak a bit more in depth about, about spectra and about the importance of, of these sorts of things, but just generally, this is um, the, the AM1.5 spectrum. So this is typically a spectrum that we see on Earth. Um, and so the, the sunlight spectrum, these absorption lines are all the um, absorption lines through the atmosphere, for example, through water. So we have a particular spectrum and when we test them, and you see this probably in the next talks, we need to make sure we, we simulate the spectrum as much as possible. But what will happen is we have our, our band gap of our semiconductor, and if we shine light in that's um, some of the infrared light, which is, which is very low energy, there won't be enough energy to excite electrons to the conduction band, so that light will just pass through the solar cell and won't be absorbed. 
and be transparent. So we won't be able to harvest that light and that won't contribute to useful power. But if we come in with high energy light, so for example, blue light, then we have more than enough energy to promote this electron to the conduction band and that um, electron will be promoted it, and we can then transport that electron in that hole to the electrodes. And what will happen is if we if we start with too much energy in this case, then we'll lose some energy to heat, and that's um, that's inevitable there. Uh, but at least we will excite the electron that can then do useful useful work. So when we think about what the what the band gap should be, so so we can think about the, the band gap of the semiconductor. We need to absorb enough sunlight. So from what I just showed you there, we we need to have as low a band gap as possible to absorb as much light as possible, so that we can absorb even some of the near infrared light. So typically, if we look at the, the current density of um, an absorber layer, and we look at the, the band gap, so as we reduce the band gap, or in other words, the absorption onset of the wavelength of light increases, we, we increase the current. This is because as we go to the lower band gap, you get more and more of the, of the light, of the solar light uh, absorbed. But there's a trade-off because what that, the, the <clears throat> the band gap essentially dictates the voltage of the cell, the photovoltage. And so we, when we have a larger band gap material, we typically can get, have a high open circuit voltage. Uh, and of course, the, um, the efficiency of the cell is a product of current and voltage. So there's a compromise between the two. So what we see typically is, is there's an efficiency maximum somewhere around 1.2 or 1.1 to 1.2 to 1.3 EV. Uh, to generate the high, or for the highest efficiency. And this gives us a maximum thermodynamic efficiency of about 33% for a solar cell. And this is because we, for a fixed band gap, we can't absorb. So when we absorb, absorb light above the band gap, we lose some fraction of the heat, and then we can't absorb light below the band gap. So this compromise ends up um, giving us a maximum at about 33%. Uh, in terms of diode formulation, how we can Think of these cells in terms of an electrical circuit. So we can think of them as they, they are diodes. Um, these, these PN junctions do make diodes. And so we can model them with, uh, we have a diode diffusion equate, uh, current that contributes here. And this is, this will happen in the dark, just related to the fact that it is a diode. And then we also have a photocurrent uh, contribution. So when we shine light, we generate current based on the, on, on the photocurrent. Um, some of these parameters, so we, we see um, this is the, the reverse saturation current, which, which corresponds to recombination of minority carriers that, diffu that, that diffuse back into the completion region. There'll be some recombination associated with that. Um, and then we also have a few other constants here. We have this ideality factor, which is something that typically, at least in silicon cells, helps to characterize uh, how ideal the solar cell is. And if we have, um, if we have deviation from, the, uh, from one, which is the ideal case, um, we, we have trapping mechanisms which contribute to that. So for example, something that's an N of about two means we're dominated by, by charge trapping. So this is a parameter that can help to characterize how good the, 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 the cell is. Um, and then in terms of how we think about efficiency and testing, so there's some key parameters that we measure. So you, you'll hear more about this in the coming talks, but you measure current voltage curves, so, so looking at as a function of applied bias, what the current is. And there's a few key parameters. One is you can extract the short circuit current. Uh, so this is the, 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 the current um, the, the current short circuit, so we're not applying any bias here. And then we also have the open circuit voltage where we, um, which is essentially the bias we need to apply to have no current flowing. These are two very key parameters. Uh, and then the shape of this current voltage curve is also important. This is called the fill factor. This is uh, essentially measure the squareness of this JV curve. It does indicate some losses, and I'll briefly touch on that in a few moments. So that we want to make this as square as possible, ideally. Um, but in reality, that, that will always have some curvature, curvature to it. Oops, sorry. So overall, the efficiency then feeds in these parameters. The efficiency is, by definition, the, uh, how much electrical power we get out, out of how much light uh, power we put in. And then we can characterize with these key parameters, the open circuit voltage, short circuit current, and the fill factor essentially gives us the, this power out. And then we have the, the light intensity coming in, which for a, a given spectrum will be well defined. Uh, and yeah, so these key parameters, these three parameters are something we want to maximize. 
the yeah. take the voltage, the short circuit current, and the feedback current. Um, so just just to, towards to, to finish, really, these lost pathways are things that are unwanted processes that we want to remove and we want to eliminate. Uh, so we can we do have a charge recombination that competes with this charge transport and charge collection, and so we 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 do in general want long carry lifetimes. So we can extract charges before they recombine. I mentioned about defects and carry trapping, so this contributes to particularly to the voltage. It, it impacts on the voltage. Uh, there's also so serious resistances as well. Um, this is resistive losses in the cell. This is typically from things like uh, low conductivity of materials uh, or having thick layers or, or contact resistance as well in the cells. And there's also shunting currents. These are um, typically things like pinholes that cause these or shorts in the device. Uh, this typically relates to the cell preparation. It's not a fundamental property. It's something that typically can be removed from uh, for, um, by processing the cell. And so just to just to um, uh, to note, this is the equivalent circuits on the bottom left here. This is the equivalent circuit of, uh, of a typical solar cell incorporating things like the series resistance and uh, the shunt resistance. So I'm just going to finish by saying is that I can talk about materials um, or the actual different technologies beyond silicon, but there is a, there's a huge number of technologies that have been explored for PV. Uh, on the left here, these are the, um, in some ways, chemically more simple materials. So things like crystalline silicon or 3.5 semiconductors like gallium arsenide. Um, they're very good semiconductors. They do have to be processed in quite complex ways because they're not defect tolerant. Um, so they typically high temperature and very controlled processing. So there's an expense uh, associated with them. Uh, and then as we move from to the left to right, you move, there, there are other materials that are some more emerging PV technologies that, that, that we and many other groups are working on around the world uh, that um, are much more simple to process. They are in general more complex. So if you think about these quantum dots here, they're actually at least sort of atomically quite complex and quite disordered. Um, but there's some sweet spots where you can get simple processing, but very high performance. And the perovskites, for example, is one example there where you can get this sort of the sweet spot of both. Um, some of the performances are competing quite well with silicon, but processing is a lot, um, a lot cheaper. Um, and I just wanted to add one of the one of the so these different technologies, one of the really um, exciting applications is in tandem cells. So I've talked a lot about one band gap of, of material. You can also have um, layer you know, multi-junctions where you layer two or even higher num high numbers of band gaps together. Where the, the top cell would harvest the, the blue wavelengths and then the red wavelengths pass through to the bottom cell. This might be, for example, this is a, a perovskite perovskite tandem here. This might be a silicon cell on the bottom. You can also have many other combinations. But here you can push this efficiency limit from, um, from 33% up to more like 45 or 50% um, because you can harvest the spectrum in, in, in a much more efficient way. Uh, most, a lot of these tandem technologies will probably reach practical efficiency of about 35%. When we compare that to silicon of 28 percent it is a huge increase particularly as you think about generation of, of, of um, electricity across a 30-year lifetime and i'll just end with this this plot which which uh, i'm not going to go into detail but this shows this is the end roll efficiency chart which just shows all of the different pv technologies in the record efficiencies across the decades and um, just to give you a flavor of how much research is going on in different cells and the top here these are the multi-junction technologies which are really very efficient but extremely expensive particularly those that use 3.5 technologies and then on the bottom right here these are the more emerging technologies which are in general lower in efficiency but are increasing but also they are much cheaper to process uh, so with that thank you to uh to, to, to people who contributed to the work uh, and i'll happy to take questions Yeah, are there any questions for Sam? Um, I think Saifu is asking in, in the chat um, regarding the cost reduction. It is nice to see how it is dropping with time, but do you think that there is possibility to drop more so that um, poor and developing countries yeah. can afford? Yeah, this is a very good question. I mean, I, so at the moment, um, a lot of these costs sort of. Uh, I mean, this, this is US data here, but the, um, 
the module cost itself is still projected to come down a lot more. So the silicon cells typically, uh, you know, they're they're now down to well, actually at best they're down to about twenty cents per watt. They're probably projected to come down another factor of two to about ten cents per watt. So that will make them much more cost effective. Um, I think the the issue is the systems and and the installation and other things like that. So I think that the module cost itself might come down a lot, but it's the infrastructure that that will still remain somewhat expensive. I think there needs good investment from you know globally to to really enable this, in particular in, in in developing countries where where PV could be really beneficial even as a as a uh, as an offline off grid power source, but does need investment to to get it off the ground, particularly in a big way. Um, one, one one other comment on that is the technologies that you know we're working on these perovskite, for example, you can have more modular factories and much lower cost, lower capex to build factories. So you can have models where lower cost panels could be made more locally as well, which would reduce the cost a lot more. And this is some conversations we're having with uh Lance having as well with with with, with, with Cypher and and your elders in the team. And then get the service since the raised hand, do you want to ask a question? Thank you very much, Sam, for your very nice talk. Uh, I just want to talk, uh, I just want to have one question which is related to charge trapping uh, in a proviscite solar cell. And so what kind of defects are observed in, yeah. um, in, um, in a proviscite solar cell? And then um, uh, what traps also observed that typically are, uh, I'm not really sure experimentally. Is it PL you are using and uh, what kind of uh, trap yeah. observed in, in a perovskite solar cells? Yeah, so, yeah, that's a good question. So the perovskite cells, so the, a lot of the defects are quite sh shallow energetically. So they're not, they're not typically, so when you think about an electron falling into a trap, it's very shallow and that electron can actually trap, come back out. And uh, those are things like, iodine vacancies, uh, and, and they're typically, uh, at least in the, in, in, in the bulk semiconductor, not that problematic. What we think is a lot of the, the deep traps where, where that is you know, deeper in the band gap, they relate to iodine interstitials. So iodine that sits sort of in between the lattice and, and that produces a deep defect. Um, we've seen, yeah, so how we probe them, luminescence and photoluminescence is a very good probe of, of traps because it, I've talked about you know the rate of recombination being something inevitable and then the trapping is something we can remove so then looking at that light coming out from a radiative component actually tells us how much of the, the defects are um uh, you know how, how much they're actually contributing so um yeah in, in the proscots they seem to be mostly at the surface and they seem to cluster into kind of nanoscale clusters of, of traps so they're not everywhere but more localized and that's something quite interesting and quite unique for these Proscat systems. And then one final thing is it seems that there is also some interface traps when you put certain contacts on, for example, fullerene since the 60s, it seems that there's some problems at those interfaces as well. Hope that answers, answers your question. And then we've got just one more question from Gatnad in the chat. What about losses at interfaces for tandem cells? Mm -hmm. Yep, there's a very good question. So any interface essentially will it gives potential for losses and we do certainly see in the tandems that, that there are losses at each of the interfaces so um this is one of the challenges of tandems the, the more complex you make them the more interfaces the more you have to you know passivate or control each of those interfaces so there is a there is a technical challenge in doing that uh, so yes we, we certainly do see that the, the tandems aren't yet you know they're not pushing towards the limits that they could be we're not pushing over 30 percent for example they're still Typically around the 24 to 25 percent mark across across the field for the proscat uh, proscat proscat tandems. The proscat silicon tandems are pushing towards 30 percent, so those interfaces are a lot better controlled, and that's partly because the silicon is very well optimized. So you then mainly just thinking about the proscat side of the cell, uh, but there is certainly potential to get to 30 percent. I think that you know we will see that even with the all proscat cells, where where that means interfaces are. You know, almost ideal. Thanks, Sam, for a very informative talk. If there's no other questions, then 
we'll move on to Chris, who will talk about um, solar spectrum. Hello, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yes. And are you seeing the full screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, first of all, um, a very good morning uh, or good afternoon to the people uh, um, present here. Um, uh, my name is Krish. I'm a fourth year PhD candidate in, in Sam's group. Um, uh, first of all, thanks very much to, to Sam and Bart for inviting me to uh, to this workshop and, and asking me to give a quick presentation on, on why uh, we should think about um, the illumination spectra that we measure our solar cells under. So I'll try to keep it very, very general so that it's applicable um, for different technologies of solar cells that Sam was talking about. Uh, but uh, I'm happy to answer uh, some questions um, at the end too. So, um, Sam has briefly shown this before, but uh, let me talk a bit more about how uh, solar spectrum looks like. So on the left, you see um, um, this is um, showing a solar spectrum where I'm uh, showing it uh, with the spectral irradiance on the y-axis versus the wavelength on the x-axis. So the spectral irradiance is nothing but um, the power output um, from, the, from, from any source, basically, in this case, sun that's incident um, uh, per unit area on a surface and we are uh, plotting it uh, with respect to uh, wavelength per wavelength so so basically if you integrate this curve in a certain region you can find out the total spectral irradiance in that particular uh, not irradiance the total uh, power output per unit area in that wavelength range so if you look at this yellow uh, curve uh, this is what shows uh, how a solar spectrum looks like as it emits from the uh, sun surface of the sun uh, and basically it mimics quite nicely with a black body spectrum um, uh, with the temperature of 5,000, uh, 2,000, uh, 5,250 degrees or close to 6,000. Um, but this is not what we get um, uh, terrestrially when we, when we put our solar cells or solar panels outside. So there are various losses uh, that we see um, as, as, the sun, uh, as the sunlight enters our atmosphere. So if you look at this red curve, that is what is showing the radiation at the sea level. So that means it's very close to what we are seeing uh, in Earth. So uh, one thing you could see that um, there is some of these drops that you see uh, starting from um, uh, some some of them in, in the UV region, some of them in uh, in even in uh, close to uh, the visible uh, and uh, more of them in the near IR region. Um, one thing to note here is that the wavelength range is here uh, shown between 100 and um, about 2,500 nanometer, but solar spectrum extends from, uh, up to even 4,000 nanometer. It's just the spectral irradiance at those wavelengths are so low that we are not showing them here. Important to note that um, because of the fusion process um, at the core, um, it also produces a lot of gamma rays, but we don't see them here because, uh, because of the internal uh, uh, absorption and thermalization, uh, those high energy gamma rays then get uh, down converted to, to low energy photons that then come to the surface of the sun and then gets emitted into the free space. Um, many of these dips that I was mentioning about is from the atmosphere. Some of them you could see the oxygen, water vapor, carbon dioxide, um, and in the UV, um, it can also be absorbed by uh, the ozone layer that, that you have. So, so basically what we get in, uh, in the atmosphere um, uh, it's 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 a reduced version of what the solar spectrum actually looks like in the free space and the other thing is that um this this reduction in the visible region is basically due to uh reflections and scattering from from uh, uh contaminants in the atmosphere or, or or even um uh like various aerosols that are there um e even our our earth surface can also uh, reflect some of the sunlight back uh, and so those are not useful uh, here I'm showing some of these ranges that are uh, broadly classified, UVC, UVB, uh, UVA. Uh, this visible range is what we can see uh, with our eyes. And you can see uh, at the spectral irradiance level, this is where most of the energy lies. 
So that's why most of the solar absorber that Stan was talking about, including silicon, uh, perovskites, and others, they are tuned to absorb mostly in the visible region so that they can make use of this uh, high spectral irradiance levels. There's also a lot of energy uh, back uh, in the near IR region and also mid IR and then far IR. However, there isn't any semiconductor material that can absorb um, up to this. Uh, there, there is some, but uh, there are other problems associated with using lower band gaps um, because you'll get lower voltage. So in essence, we should be considering about this and the near IR region for producing most of uh, our electricity. Um, now, uh, this is what I mentioned here that, that uh, where the loss is coming from in the spectrum. Now, if I have to just show the same spectrum, but uh, using some more uh, scientific terms here, um, I would quickly explain them uh, in a while why what this AM means. But if you look at this, uh, this red spectra here, this looks like uh, what you have here in the yellow. So that's the AM zero spectra. So that's what it's there in free space. And then you have uh, in the atmosphere or in the earth, you have um, uh, this AM 1.5 global, AM 1.5 direct. These are uh, like the, the standard spectra that, that, that people use uh, for terrestrial solar cells. I'd quickly explain what they mean, but you could see that this AM 1.5 global spectra is relevant for a uh, flat plate uh, terrestrial use. So all the solar panels that you see uh, on the rooftops or on the on the farm fields and other places uh, around the world, basically, uh, they are uh, they are using this AM 1.5 spectra. Although I, I must say that this is not always the case, but if you want to um, if you want to uh, measure how your device would perform uh, outside in a terrestrial environment, this is the spectra that you are looking at. The, the integrated power output uh, is 1000 watt per meter square, and that's what we call one sun. That's an important term that we always use uh, for, for terrestrial applications. This AM 1.5 direct is basically, is basically used for concentrated applications. So in the global case, you also have a direct sun rays and also some diffuse sun rays from scatterings. But here for the direct case, you don't have any diffused uh, components, so you, you can consider all of them uh, um, and make them direct. Um, so this is uh, used for concentrated applications where you can track the sun as it moves. Um, and then for the AM0 is what I said before, it's in the space where there is no, there is no scattering or absorption uh, that we see in the atmosphere. And, and the integrated power output is higher, about 1,366 watt per meter square. Now, let me come back to what this AM uh, air mass or AM means. So um, in this in this figure, you could see that this is our earth surface. Um, sun is coming, so there is an, it has to go through this uh, atmosphere. So now, um, depending on what time uh, of the day it is or where you are, uh, was the latitude of the location you are looking at, your sun would have some angle uh, related to the normal to the Earth's surface. Um, and accordingly, if this is not overhead completely like here, you, the sun has to effectively go through a longer distance uh, to reach there. So the ratio of this distance over this is basically what, what uh, we call uh, air mass. Um, and this could also be approximated by one over uh, cosine of this, this angle here. Um, uh, and, and you could look at that this AM 1.5 that I was mentioning before uh, refers to this angle of about 48.2 degrees. So now this um, Z equal to zero means your sun is completely here, so it's so it's it's more relevant for uh, for equatorial uh, equatorial places or even even uh, in in summer times uh, around noon when sun is over uh, over um, uh, over the head. So then you could get close to AM one, AM one, but um, very close to the morning or or in the afternoon evening you you move away from this because the day's sun is now down in the sky, so it is more slanted. So uh, you you now then go to AM 1.5 or even some to AM 2 and 3. So now why did we choose AM 1.5 is is because this was defined for uh, for for most of the locations in the mid uh, latitude uh, because most of the most of the population lives in the mid latitude region. So so it was chosen to be the standard um, for for measurements. Although I must mention that this is not constant as I said before. Uh, but for your uh, indoor uh, measurements, this is what we consider. Now, how do we uh, how do we actually measure um, our cells inside? Because we can't take our cells outside all the time to measure uh, uh, how good it is uh, under the real sunlight. So we have to mimic the sunlight 
somehow. So we need some 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 light producing sources. So these could be lamps, uh, and I would, I would go over a few uh, of the options that are possible here that can mimic uh, solar spectra um, reasonably well. One uh, is the xenon arc lamp, which is the most commonly used in solar simulators. Um, it has got a good match with the solar spectrum. You could see here, uh, if you filter this xenon arc lamp, you um, you can basically get an, a good match with, with this black, which is the AM1.5G reference solar spectrum. Um, it, it has the problem that it has got some uh, sharp peaks um, in the near IR region, um, and, and 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 that's a problem. You could you could of course use some from some filters there, but it still uh, is is a problem. However, the disadvantages for these kind of lamps are that uh, they they consume a lot of power, as is the case with most of the lamps. Uh, they need regular maintenance, so you need to replace them after every every uh, certain number of hours. Um, they have short life cycles and and they have high cost. So. Uh, so that's the so that's the case with xenon arc lamps. Um, similarly, with the uh, quartz tungsten halogen lamps, um, uh, they they also provide an excellent match with the black body spectrum. Uh, but mostly in the near IR region, you could see that there is a huge mismatch uh, uh, in 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 the visible region, and therefore these kind of lamps are very good for uh, for for uh, illuminating um, in the near IR region. They are uh, low cost, so they can be used. Um, um, in, in large area solar simulators and, and they are in general used in conjunction with other lamps in, uh, in multi-source solar simulators. Um, so they can't be used uh, um, standalone because in this visible region it's, it's not a very good match. Similarly for the metal halide arc lamp or the HMI lamp, um, this is originally uh, developed for the film and television lighting where, where you need high temporal stability as well as a good match to daylight which is what it does. Uh, and you could uh, basically you could see this this uh, red um, curve is an unfiltered one. If you if you filter that with a suitable optical filter, you can get a good optical match to to AM 1.5. That's what you want. They are low cost and can be useful for large area solar illuminations. Um, disadvantage again include the higher power conversion and and shorter life cycles. So that that's been the general problem of of the lamps. There were other lamps that were used. Um, uh, like carbon arc lamp which have uh, an emission closer to AM0 and therefore as I mentioned before uh, you can use that for solar simulators that uh, you want to produce uh, extraterrestrial solar spectra so you could measure your solar cells there and, and then you can you can get sort of a guess how it will perform if you if you put it in a satellite uh, for a space mission um, again you could use some suitable optical filters get a spectrum close to AM1.5 um, you could see that this has got higher UV emission, which is good um, uh, uh, because um, not many other uh, uh, lamps can produce that. Um, however, it is generally weaker than the xenon arc lamp that I said before. Uh, disadvantages include unstable operation and short lifetime, and therefore this is not very popular these days in, in the solar simulators. However, now with the, with the advancement of semiconductor technologies, especially photonics, um, as Sam mentioned before, um, you have got newer uh, PN junction devices uh, uh, coming up, which can produce light, um, which is not a lamp. So basically, you can you can apply, uh, you can inject some carriers into the semiconductors through some some contacts, and then they can re re recombine and produce light. And that's what we call the light emitting diodes. They have the inherent advantages of uh, low power conversion and the longer operational lifetimes. So that's something good about them as compared to when you think about the lamps. However, you could see here that if you don't have the right combination of the LEDs, because the problem with LEDs is that they are not broadband emitters, so they, they have, like most of them are not, uh, they, they have a small bandwidth of about 10 to 100 nanometers, so if you want to cover the whole region, you need a cluster of LEDs uh, chosen appropriately, uh, so if you don't have a good uh, combination of them, you can see there is a huge mismatch with your AM 1.5G spectrum, but if you can tune your LEDs nicely, you can get a very nice uh, uh, spectrum. So this is a uh, good thing that it is tunable uh, and it has got uh, various applications um, if you want to let's say excite your your device only with a certain region uh, of the solar spectra LEDs make it much easier to do that as compared to lamps so that's why uh, more and more uh, manufacturers are now uh, moving to LED uh, light sources. Of course um, if you want to have high power uh, uh, high power illumination you have to go to lasers which is again another semiconductor photonic device where you, you, you inject much more current than in the LED and you need a, a, an optical feedback mechanism for, for, um, for, uh, for producing high power light. 
So um, they have high intensities and, and they are easy to focus, that's good. Um, however, the problem with lasers are they, are they have a small spot size, so, so they can eliminate only small area. Uh, but the good thing is because you can, you're eliminating a small area, you can potentially get much higher power densities. So you can use them for uh, testing solar concentrators, which need uh, intensities uh, about tens to hundreds of suns. Now, once you have these lamps, they are only one part of the solar simulator. You also have electronics and then other optics for focusing, um, power supply and all to, to produce a, a solar simulator. Now, at the end, the solar simulators are defined um, by some metrics um, that, that, that are uni universally um, um, recognized now. So um, these three, uh, the top three uh, have been there for a long time and they are uh, part of the classification uh, of the solar simulators currently. The, the last two have been added two years ago. So I would, I would go over each of them and quickly explain to you what they mean. So the first one is the spectral match, which is very important because you are trying to mimic the solar spectra. So you have to ensure that your, your solar simulator spectra is, is nicely matched to the, to the AM 1.5 uh, G spectra. So, so what you, so how, how does this spectral match is, uh, is, is calculated? So here you can see that for AM 1.5 direct, uh, global and AM zero calculated from this uh, spectra, you have the percentage of the total emission uh, from this reference spectra that you have here. Now, you once you have this table with you for the reference spectra, you, you calculate similar things for, for your uh, solar simulator spectra, and then you divide the, the percentage emission from your solar simulator spectra divided by the percentage emission from this uh, reference spectra over a certain wavelength range, and that will give you a spectral match factor. So that's the first thing. Second thing, um, uh, okay. So you could see that in the in in this table, it only uh, shows you values between 400 and 1100 nanometers. That's because these uh, these um, um, uh, values were were initially agreed when when silicon was the dominant uh, semiconductor. So silicon has a band gap close to about 1100 nanometers. So all these standards were made initially to cover uh, silicon. However, as there are more and more semiconductors uh, now in the research phase and some in the industry as well, uh, this table has now been updated. Uh, and you can see that now it, it goes from 300 uh, up to 1200. And, and basically you do the same thing here, um, um, divide your, uh, um, your simulator spectra with your, uh, with your um, reference spectra over a certain range and you can find the spectral match. Next to the spatial uniformity, which is very important. So especially for a large area solar um, a simulator, you need to ensure that your the, the power density that, that's on your sample is the same across a, as much as possible a spatial distance. So what you, what you see here, how you calculate that is you have the short circuit current from any solar cell that you're measuring. You measure them at different points and you have the maximum current and the minimum current and you see how, how much they are different. So that's that's a measure of the spatial uniformity, which is again, a very important characteristics of, of how good a solar simulator is. Then for a temporal stability, you don't want the, the, the intensities to fluctuate. So you, you measure the same point uh, over a period of time. And if you don't see um, the current changing, that's a good measure that, you, that your solar simulator is um, is, uh, is is temporarily stable. Um, there are these two new uh, um, matrix which have been added, uh, as I said, in 2020. Uh, the spectral coverage uh, means uh, that um, the percentage of the solar stim uh, simulator emission, that is at least 10% of the reference solar spectrum at a given wavelength. So basically it is trying to tell you that over what range in your solar spectrum you can ideally Call it a representative version of your uh, of your uh, of your reference AM 1.5 spectra. Uh, beyond a certain wavelength, when it's not emitting um, uh, many photons, you you can't really uh, call it uh, representative in that wavelength um, for for the for the solar spectra. So this is basically telling you what's the range over which it kind of represent represents not to the best, but it could see at least 10% of the reference solar spectra. It doesn't affect the current classification as I would come uh, in a minute, but this is a new uh, thing that's now being added. And so is the spectral deviation, which, which basically measures the total percentage deviation between the emitted solar simulator spectrum and your reference solar spectrum. Now, um, 
the current solar simulators that are there in in the market and and that are that are basically purchased uh, by all the laboratories that measure solar cells indoor um, look at only these three uh, these three metrics the spectral match the spatial uh, non-uniformity and the temporal instability and you could see that um, initially again until uh, two years ago you had these three classes class a b c for each of these factors um, so um, uh, for the spectral match if it's between 0.75 and 1.25 we call it in class a uh, uh, spectral match uh, and then for a, sp a spatial non-uniformity it has to be um, lower than or equal to two percent uh, then for the temporal stability instability lower than or equal to two percent so that that's good um, and if you if you somehow um, know that your solar simulator is in is a triple a solar simulator then you know that it it uh, it satisfied all the three conditions uh, that i mentioned here the class b is a little bit it, it's little worse and class c is, is not very good and if if these parameters are beyond this range you call this class u or unclassified however now uh, with with uh, better manufacturing capabilities now you get extremely good uh, solar simulators um, which uh, which have very good um, uh, um, spectral mass, spatial non-uniformity, and the temporal instability, and that's why this new class, class A plus, was added uh, to this IEC standard in 2020, um, and and so so do those um, could be used uh, going forward as well. And, and in Cambridge, you have got uh, many of these solar simulators. Uh, I'm showing you one here, the, this ABET solar simulator um, that we have in one of the buildings. Um, uh, we also have a TS space systems uh, solar simulator um, uh, with a large area so solar simulator um, and and we are getting a new one uh, I don't I don't know how it looks like but I, I guess it's an LED solar simulator if I'm not wrong so that's going to come as well so so there are multiple different solar simulators which use different lamps as I said before I have different matrix as I mentioned before and, and we are we are interested in all of them um, because we want to measure our devices reliably um, irrespective of how good your solar simulator is on paper, uh, you have to ensure that when you are measuring your device, uh, this is under one sun. And when I say one sun, um, if you remember, I said thousand watt per meter square. So, because uh, most of these lamps are um, uh, are arc lamps, so basically you have to apply some current and voltage. So you need to ensure you are applying the right uh, current voltage to to get. Uh, what uh, power density that you want so so a way to check that is 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 this so-called reference cell which is nothing but a good quality um, sensor for the de determination of the solar radiance levels so we basically uh, do this measurement every time we we want to measure um, a solar cell so that's a good early check to see we are measuring under the right conditions um, so um, uh, these are these are made by different manufacturers. Here I have taken it from the Vera Solutions, and we have one of them. Uh, I think a couple of them in in our lab. But then there are other manufacturers which make them. They can be made by different materials. And here I'm showing you um, a curve here. Um, so like a quartz filtered um, uh, silicon ha has got a spectral something like this um, for this reference cell. And one important thing to mention is that which reference cell you want to use depends on what uh, device you want to measure. So ideally. You would like to have a reference cell that has got a uh, onset very close to um, uh, your your uh, uh, material. Let's say for for us uh, for a silicon solar cell which has got a uh, which has got a band gap of one point one electron volt. This so this one can can work very well. And and for the gamma arsenide solar cell, this can this can work very well. However, for for many of the other systems which do not yet have their own reference cells, we have to somehow ensure that these ones that are already available, you can tune them for your use. Like for your perovskites, which which have um, let's say band gaps around uh, 800 or 850, this KG5 uh, filter that you put on top of this uh, unfiltered silicon can 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 give you um, a close um, um, match with how your uh, device. Um, um, uh, spectra would look like and and that's a good uh, that's a good estimation of the of your solar intelligence level so if your solar simulator is emitting um, at the right intensity you should see the right current that is uh, provided by the manufacturer for any of them you use um, but um, if there is some problem in the non-uniformity or, or 
or there is some spectral mismatch you might be uh, not you might not be getting the right, right currents and that's why it's a, it's a good measure to check them before you start measuring uh, your devices um, I think uh, this is where I'd end. Um, I thank you very much for, for your attention um, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have. Um, I see Ray Sand from Gattaso, um, go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I just have one, one question. So if you try to compare um, irradiance as a function of wave things uh, at a diff different environment, for example, it can, it can be the, in the equator, North Pole or South Pole, how it look like, for example. Did you um, consider uh, environmental variations um, to look at the, the real spectrums uh, of irradiance as a function of wavelengths? That's a very good point you've made. And that's what we don't cover here, as I said. Um, um, if you have let's say if you have some some if you have a solar panel um put in the north pole or the south pole which is like which is which is far away from the equator you have a high latitudes so in those in those cases you don't necessarily get as much sun there so there's a lot of diffuse uh uh light reaching there so so you don't necessarily see similar spectra so so the intensity or the irradiance would be much lower there um we don't yet have how it looks like because that's that's not uh, something that uh, people have um, I think done. Um, what I'm showing here is 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 um, AM 1.5, which is basically for for geographic locations with latitudes close to about 10 to 30 or 40 degrees from the equator on the north and the south side. So that's where most of the people live, and that's why it's kind of uh, it's kind of agreed that let's go ahead with this AM 1.5. But that's a very good point that geographic location. Uh, time of the year, seasons, and all of them have their own influence on how this solar spectrum, actual solar spectrum outdoor would look like. But this is more of like a representative spectrum that you could replicate in our lab to, to identify if, if our device is performing well or not and what's the efficiency and how we could improve that. I hope that answers your question. Yes, exactly. Um, I mean, this is sort of just a standard so we can compare between labs. But yeah, in real world conditions, you will have so many more variables that actually change, it's like pollution, weather conditions, and all these things. So yeah, it'll it'll look very different depending on, on where in the world you are. Um, and Amara, do you want to ask a question as well? Yeah, actually, one of the questions is already raised regarding the the, the geographical location, specifically we are living near the equator. So the idea of 48 degree will be the standard. The other is, what about the, the conditions in the room, internal conditions? Is there any any types of standards to, to set up the conditions inside the room? Uh, you are asking me about indoor measurements, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's... Uh, simulators are mostly defined for indoor measurements. So. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, you could... Um, so... There are two things. So these are semiconductor uh, materials that you use in solar cells. So they, their properties would change with temperature. So that's one thing. Um, how they change would depend on what material it is. Uh, so so uh, perovskites would have a different behavior at high temperature as compared, let's say, silicon. But if you want to have a reproducible measurement that can be uh, uh, done in several laboratories, you need to be uh, very sure about uh, like maintaining a certain temperature, so so there is there is um, some capability to add some cooling stage um, um, there, uh, so that if if uh, your solar cell is like has having higher heat due to prolonged illumination, you would you can cool them so that it's it's consistently being there at a certain temperature, so that you could measure the true performance rather than uh, the degraded one. Um, but again, this this is just just uh, uh, just an advantage that we have in the lab that we could do that, but in the outdoor environment, you can't control your temperature. So you can't control temperature of, let's say, what you are telling about 48 degrees or 40 degrees just to 20 degrees. So that's um, so that's an advantage that we have in the lab. But again, uh, that's why what we measure in the lab would vary substantially outside because not only the geographical locations that uh, that we mentioned before, the temperature is again a very important uh, um, factor that we uh, don't always consider, but can have um, remarkable influence in, in how your material performs. 
so yeah, you're, you're very right. Um, performance would be massively different if 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 your panel is is increased um, in temperature, especially if you have a hot spot there. This would really kill um, kill your uh, performance, um, and that that is possible, especially for for those solar concentrated devices uh, where you where you um, uh, illuminate with much higher intensities than one sun. We have a question in the chat uh, from Binium. Did the tilt angle affect the irradiance? Um, yes, exactly. So uh, you could see that this is AM 1.5. So that has a tilt angle of, uh, as I said, uh, this is a 48 degrees. You could see you go to AM 2, it's got a different angle, AM 3 different angles. And 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 so so the, all of these angles are are traversed um, in a certain, in a, in a day itself. Uh, uh, but it's just that you consider a 1.5 because uh, that's kind of an average that you have, uh, let's say, for over a day, uh, because you have um, close to a m1 around the noon, um, close to about uh, 1.5 or something, just before or after that, and then in the early morning uh, when the sun is uh, rising or in the setting, you have you have more of these tilts, um, so then you have higher a m values. So this is like a, just like a useful compromise that, that people have made to, to consider AM 1.5 uh, as like the global uh, standard for, for, for measuring these uh, devices. Yeah, I suppose that this is why there's also tracking solar panels, right? That sort of follow, yeah. follow the sun and, and minimize yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so one more question from Geta. So what about, about the time variation for I versus wavelength near to equator? Uh, sorry, um, get to, so do you want, or maybe want to ask the question? Okay, thank you very much, Bart. And so I would like to know um, if you, near to equator, for example, uh, you explained at a different angles how you can measure the radiance uh, as a function of wavelengths. But uh, what about the time variation? So if you start from the early morning and yeah. then later on in the evening, so did you did you observe? The, the kind of variations uh, for the spectra uh, uh, as a function of wavelengths. Yeah, that, that no, no, that, that's important. Um, the all of, so if I so there are two things. One is the geographical location, as you mentioned. There is another thing is the time of the day or, or the season. Let's say um, now c consider that we are at the on the equator. So so there is no uh, there is no distance far far from the equator. But then if you then go north to south of that, you will have some some effect um, uh, in the radiance just due to the latitude. But again, as I said before, um, at the very early morning or in the evenings, when the sun is lower in the sky, you you have um, this angle which is which is much higher. And according to its AM values, is much higher than one point five. Whereas closer to the noon, this is much lower than AM one point five because uh, in the summer time in the mid latitudes. Um, near noon you have the sun on top of your head so that's basically this sun is somewhere here so this angle is basically zero so this is am1 so so that's that's basically what i said is there is a change every minute in the solar spectra outdoor is just that it's very impossible for us to measure or any 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 group to reproducibly measure in the lab that's why we have taken a useful compromise of am1.5 but but not i would say not a single minute it will have one a1.5 exact in outdoor conditions. So you'll always have these variations uh, that you were mentioning before. Yeah, it's exactly like, you, you can see it already in the sky, like in the morning, the sky is sort of reddish and at noon it's blue, uh, which means that the different wavelengths are, are scattered differently. So the, you know, it's, it's, it definitely changes relatively during the day as well. Um, I, I hope that answers your question. So, so um, Amar, you have another question. Regarding the projectors, I have seen, uh, in addition to class A, class B, I have seen a types of class which starts AA, that is triple uh, A, ABA, and ABB. I don't know what does it mean. Have you go through that? Yeah. Sorry. So uh, um, I think I, I quickly mentioned them here. Um, let me go to the right slide. Um, I think it's here, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you could see that. Um, as I mentioned, there are different metrics of, of the solar simulators. Um, the most important of them being the spectral match, spatial non-uniformity, and the temporal instability. And each of these uh, matrix 
can be defined in terms of class A, B, C, and 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 more newly uh, A plus. So these depend on what values that each of these parameters gives and how you calculate the values. I, I said before, for the spectral match, you basically divide uh, the the irradiance. Um, uh, total uh, total power output uh, from your solar simulator divided by that from the reference spectrum for a certain wavelength range. Um, here it's considering all intervals, as I said before, that there are multiple inter intervals people consider, something like here. Um, then you have the second uh, thing, uh, spatial non-uniformity, and, 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 and basically you, you measure your solar cells uh, spatially across multiple locations, and you try and track the current uh, from a solar cell. And, and see how much it varies and then you can calculate that um, uh, from from here as I said uh, and for the third one which is the temporal instability uh, you can measure at the same point track the current if it's changing that means your your lamp uh, or, or an LED or whatever uh, you are using uh, to produce the the spectra is not temporarily stable so based on these three parameters you name them AAA so when people when you are saying that you have seen triple A solar simulator that that means it, it it ticks the spectral oh. match, spatial non-uniformity, and temporal instability. All of them in this range. If it's ABA, it's like that, so. This is mentioned in this particular order. So this ABA means it is it ticks the spectral match A, but then goes to B for spatial non-uniformity, and then goes to A again for the temporal instability. I hope that clears. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks, Chris. If if there's no further questions, then. Uh, thank you, Krish, for, for this very nice talk. Um, and now I'll move on, on to Yu Chen, who will talk about defining the active area in, in solar cells. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, okay, let me share my PowerPoint. Okay, right now. Uh, is it full screen now? Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Bart, Chris, and Sam's uh, nice talk and introduction before. So my name is Yu Xin Jiang, and I'm going to talk about like a, a how the active area uh, affect the solar cells measurement, and uh, I'll tell you like some. Uh, be careful of this uh, active area, and uh, if not, we might have some like a uh, uh, error measurement. And I'm a PhD student in strength lab working on the perovskite solar cells. Uh, so at the beginning, I'm going to show you like a what how does it look like for a, a solar cells measurement. So this uh, left hand side figure is a, a setup of a solar simulator. So for example, we I, we definitely need uh, like a solar simulator to excite our subtrace. So sorry, uh, excite our solar cells. And then in this sort of simulator, like Chris mentioned, we can have a different type of uh, uh, lamps or a different kind of uh, spectrum, like one one uh, and one point five by m and zero. It depends on what kind of uh, uh, solar cells we want to measure. It depends on our need in the power to reach like a uh, uh, one some intensity. So and uh, also like uh, we can adjust the lamp height, so we can like a. Uh, increase or reduce the power a little bit. And then we have a cooling fan to make sure we are not burning our lamps. And uh, except this, we have a solar cells on our uh, substrate stage. And uh, the substrate stage, usually we need to connect to a cooling uh, water system. So we make sure the temperature is set at like a 25 degree or room temperature. The reason is why uh, the device performance is a function of temperature. So. If your uh, solar cell is under light soaking, it might hit up to like a 40 or 50 degree. And in end, as we have a uh, case, it might be difficult to compare the results uh, with different groups or different labs. And then our solar cells were connected to uh, uh, a monitor with a computer system so we can track the uh, our solar cells performance. So here, the right-hand side figure is just a typical JV curve. I think Sam has mentioned this. So uh, in the case we have, in this case, we have a monitor to record a, a current density in terms of a voltage, different voltage bias. So we can finish this JV curve scan. And uh, 
uh, there's also called a power voltage uh, curve. So in just like a multipolar current and uh, voltage here. So we can determine our maximum power point here. So here, this point, it means we, uh, uh, it's a voltage we have for the best device performance. And the point here, we call it field factor, which uh, is an active, it's an area of this square divide uh, the outer one. So then we can know about, uh, the charge transportation property or uh, uh, any defects in our system or any like a loss from uh, uh, substrate, for example. And here, just like a basic uh, concept of a source of measurement. And after that, I'm going to tell you like, uh, what's the uh, effect of the uh, mask. The mask I'm talking about is like a, when we do the soil cells measurement, this is just a simple uh, 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 multi, multi layer solar cells will uh, uh, light bias to excite our solar cells. And under such a circumstance, we might have the light coming from the refractor light or the diffuse light from the other part. In this case, we might uh, end up increasing the uh, incident photon to our solar cells. So to avoid this situation, we have a shadow mask. So we only have an aperture area, only like a, uh, in the middle of solar cells. So we can define like a, we only have a light coming from this uh, certain area. So in this case, we have this aperture area to define our active area of solar cells. So if we have this system, then uh, we will see like uh, without a mask, we will have a higher current density because we have a light coming from the diffuse or the fraction of a system light from other place. And after we place a mask, we will like a reduce or like a calibrate uh, current density to like uh, what we expect. And this is just a JB curves with or without a mask for a, a certain like a proscite solar cells with an atmospheric sequence. Seven. And then you can see like with a mask, it's a, a, a black or a red curves. And once we put a, a mask with different uh, active area, you can see the JV curve should shift a little bit. So the why we have this shift is that like, uh, first, once we have a smaller mask area, then we will have a lower device VOC output. The reason is that if you see the right hand side continue figure, this is a solar simulator, and we have a red mask to yeah. define the active area in the middle. Yeah. So, during, uh, under this situation, we only excite uh, uh, your uh, uh, photo absorber in the middle. So, we create a photo generated electron and hole. And this electron and hole will go to the uh, top and bottom. And then uh, you will see like other parts of a solar system. So, uh, solar cells, they are still in a dark condition. So in this dark condition, the air training hole will still recombine, uh, recombinate and create the dark current. So in this case, uh, the higher dark current will reduce the, the VOC, so according to the form formula here. So this is a device uh, open circuit voltage in terms of function of uh, uh, plasma uh, uh, and the temperature. So here is like a, we need to consider the geometric factor of the mask. So the ge ge geometric factor is like a, it is defined by the cell area by the mask area. So it means that if we have a smaller mask, we have a more loss because we increase the uh, uh, dark current in our system. So that's why when we do a JV curve measurement, if we have a mask, first we reduce the current density because we prevent the light from diffuse or refractant uh, 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 instant light. And the second is uh, if we have a small mask, we inc increase the uh, dark area in our system, so we reduce the VOC. So this is something we need to uh, bear in mind. It's like once we put a mask, we also reduce the VOC than uh, it should be. So it's just uh, like a, a right corner, the right corner, just like a, a different geometric factor, we will expect different uh, VOC loss. So, in this case, ideally, it's like we want to have a mask to define active area, and the mask should be just a little bit smaller than our active area. Otherwise, we will have uh, we suffer the uh, VOC loss during our measurement. And also, if we take a look back to our JV curves, it's like once we reduce the VOC, 
we also like uh, change the uh, maximum power point, point. So we, it means like we change the field factor of uh, the Z curves. So from the red to blue, uh, actually we also increase the field factor of the, the, uh, our solar cells. So it might like uh, overestimate our device performance a little bit. So just we need to be careful, like we have to, to use a mask but the mask should not be like too small. Otherwise we might first like, uh, reduce the uh, real VOC and also increase the field factor by this uh, kind of artifact measurement. So this is something we need to bear in mind of this uh, mask effect. And uh, another point is like I want to mention is during the measurement or during the fabrication, uh, we have the uh, ITO subtract like uh, this pattern. So we have uh, uh, nine ITO with this dark blue region. And this is a, a design of an ITO with a one by one inch uh, size. And once we ask the manufacturer to order or pattern this ITO, we always have a, a tolerance. Like the, the size is not exactly at one inch by one inch. You might have like, a, for example, here is a 0.1 millimeter tolerance. So it might be a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller. And then when we finish our device, we put this uh, one inch device in our subject frame. So the subject frame is like the way we fix the our ITO so we can deposit the uh, other active area or the electro for example. But also when we ask uh, another uh, supplier to make the, this subject frame, we always have another tolerance that is around again 0.1 millimeter each. So in this case, uh, this uh, subject frame cannot be exactly the same size of ITO. It has to be a little bit bigger. So as otherwise the sub, the, our ITO cannot be fit in this subject frame. But the case is that uh, if you want to have a uh, deposit our electrode to finish uh, uh, full device, we also have uh, another pattern here. So we can define our IT failure based on this uh, different mass pattern. So after the electrode deposition, we can see this uh, overlap from this ITO, the left, left hand side to uh, electrode on the top. So this uh, overlapping area is uh, our active area for the solar cells. So when we do the measurement only in this overlapping area uh, can be calculated as a real working area. But the thing is that uh, if our tolerance of ITO or any kind of software frame or pattern is too big, we might end up to have a bind bad alignments. So in this right-hand side figure is like a, if the tolerance is too big, we might have a shift or uh, it's a pattern offset. So you can see that in this case, the electrode is actually a little bit like uh, outside the ITO area. So in this case, we might have a, a less anti failure. So underestimate our device performance, especially the current density. So this is something we need to bear in mind. Like we need to have a, a good tolerance of ITO subtract and all, uh, once we only decide also this subject frame or deposition pattern, we need to uh, keep in mind that uh, what's a, a, a rational system to define this active area. And then once we do a measurement, like I said before, we need to put a shadow mask on the top of uh, this uh, ITO, or sorry, a uh, full device. So here's like a, it's a kind of our uh, measurement mask in Cambridge. So we have a 9.9 millimeter square so active area. So it's just a, uh, here is also like for example a piece of the uh, uh, black black uh, uh, capacity or something. So you have a nine or eight holes to define active area. So once you put the, your uh, mask on this our uh, device, you need to make sure, sure this uh, mask mask is taking into account the tolerance from the structure, the pattern, or the structure front. Otherwise, the mask may not might not be like a only confined the active area. It might offset to the the different position and again like a uh, underestimate the your device performance. But so in this case, uh, usually a measurement mass has to be uh, smaller than the real the offset or the tolerance is not is is covering the uh, all active area. But the mass is, shouldn't be too small, otherwise we have the VOC uh, loss and uh, uh, artifact field factor measurement. So this is something we need to uh, all consider in our system to make sure our device performance is like a, 
uh, reliable and can be compared uh, to different groups. And finally, I want to say like this. So in our uh, lab scale, we always have used, we always, always use like a very small uh, device, like a 9.9 millimeter square, but in the real world architecture, so we try to uh, scale up the device so we can power the more energy from the, from the, the uh, solar energy harvesting. So here, just uh, another skin of a lab scale device, we have an attic area of here, maybe just 0.1 centimeter square, which is very small. Uh, the reason why we don't want to scale, uh, no, we don't want to be, uh, or a challenge we could not scale up so easily because like, uh, um, one thing we need to consider is, uh, at least is a uh, resistance of a TCO, like a tr uh, transparent conductive oxide. In this case, if for example, it's an FTO, so the FTO, uh, uh, resistance of FTO usually is much larger than the gold or steel where electrodes. So, once we enlarge the device architecture, you will see the uh, resistance shift resistance is depending on the, the uh, distance between uh, it, the two electrodes. So for example, it's an X here. So it's a uh, relation to the square of the distance. So once we have a much bigger size, we have a much uh, shift resistance, so reduce our device performance. So if you want to scale up the device from the large scale to the real like different uh, solar cells pattern. For example, usually a large scale is a 0.05 or 0.1 centimeter square, which is quite small. So if you want to enlarge it, enlarge to the module, you need to uh, prevent this uh, uh, shift resistance effect. So most of the research group, they are trying to use a module systems, which means they cut the solar cells to small pieces and then use a external um, a mental connection to connect all these pieces to the big module, and then you can have a, a real a real world application here. But the challenge here is not just the, not just about the shift resistance, also like a, a how you can deposit a uniform film from this very small large scale device to uh, like a two hundred centimeter square modules, and also like we need to consider the loss between the charge transportation between the interfaces or the uh, atferia or the the, the, res the resistance across the whole device. So this is something we need to consider as well. And I think that's the end of my talk. So uh, thank you so much. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Yushan. Uh, are there any questions? No, if not, then Hello. Oh, can I ask yes. Question? Yeah. 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 I, I have one point to raise. Uh, I, I feel that the aquifera is uh, already defined by the position because uh, it is the over, overlap area of the two electrodes and the observer layer. So uh, I, I, I didn't see the advantage of using the external masking. OK, so you mean like why we need to use the mask even we have overlapping area here? Uh, because we already have overlapping area and uh, during the deposition by the overlapping area, the, the active area is defined. Yeah. Therefore, what is the, un the need of using external masking? So uh, uh, first thing is that we had to use the mask because like uh, in here, the, the figure A. So even here, like uh, you have an uh, overlapping area here, but we might have a uh, light coming from the refractance or diffuse, and not just uh, directly from the solar simulator. So in this case, we might have an uh, extra light because when we do a, a measurement, we want to have a uh, 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 fixed uh, solar power, like a 1 mm.5 global in, uh, intensity. But once if we don't have a mask, we might have uh, more power from like, uh, not just from solar simulator, maybe from the refraction from the, the DEX or from other mental parts or other system. So that's why we want to have a mask so we can prevent the light coming from other direction or other angle to go to our uh, device here. Mm -hmm. Maybe just add to that, Yishin, and, and get that. It's, you, you can actually get quite a lot of current coming from that, that side area if you, if you don't mask. So you can overestimate currents quite a lot. But it, it is yeah. really important to, to have these aperture masks. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 
I see a question from Minya in the chat. Uh, can we use any material as external light blocking to reduce the effect? Okay, can you say again? Uh, Minya, how do you, do you want to explain a bit more what you mean with, with your question? Okay, uh, I want to say that is, uh, can we use any material, that light blocking material to uh, reduce the external lighting effect, uh, the light effect to the measurement? Any material that uh, block the external light or it's a special design material to use as a... Uh, uh, I mean, for this mask, um, yeah, sure mask well, yeah, so usually while we is based, uh, usually we don't want to use uh, any uh, mental materials because you might like uh, contact with your device to cause shunting. And also the mask we want is like a uh, black. So we it's not going to reflect other lights to our uh, device as well. And also the thickness of the mask should be very thin. Otherwise the light may just uh, uh, reflect to from the uh, between the uh, mask thickness. So we have to have the black, dark color and like a very thin mask and especially non-mental materials for this kind of mask uh, choice. Yeah, so I'm just put a, a really good paper in the chat as well um, about uh, the issues if you don't use a, a testing mask. Um, I think very earlier also put a, a link to a paper uh, about the tilt angles. If, if you want more information, just look in the chat. Um, so if there's no further questions, then uh, thank you, Shen, again, and, and we'll move on to the next part, uh, which is, is, a, is a short tutorial on the, the setup that, um, that we built here and that will hopefully ship soon uh, to you guys in, in Ethiopia. Um, so it's it's the, the multi-pixel uh, measurement setup. Um, it basically consists of, of roughly four different components, which I'll introduce each separately. Um, in addition to this, we'll also send you um, a, a small area LED solar simulator, um, so you can you know compare your outside with with inside measurements, and we'll also send a a silicon reference cell. Um, so you can you know, check the, the intensity of, uh, of your, um, your solar simulator. Uh, so I'll first talk a bit about our, our, our devices. So you've already seen the, the design in UCN slides as well. I'll talk about that a bit more. Um, then I've, I've got some videos of the device holder, the multiplex and the software. And these are lab-based things. So I've, I've made some videos just to be sure that, that everything is working. Um, so the device all is, is something we customly build to fit our devices um, to work with, with these multiplexers and this way we can measure 32 pixels at the same time and we've also written some Python software to, to operate these multiplexers and process data. Um, so our device, as Yushan said, we have a glass slide with uh, ITO on top in, in this pattern as you see here. So we've basically got these eight pads, each for um, one small solar cell or pixel. And then we've got this area in the middle where there's also ITO, but we can use this for, for optical measurements. Um, then first step is we deposit all our, um, all our active layers. So we, we've got like an electron transporting material, whole transporting material in between it. We've got the perovskite, so you can see it's black, it absorbs all the visible light. Um, then after that, we deposit the, the metal, which is sort of the, the, the top contact. Um, and then if, if you look at how we can connect these, you can, every time you can connect one of these metal pads with the, the corresponding ITO pad. So you've got your, your solar cell there. And you can see the schematic here that we've got eight, eight little solar cells on this one inch substrate. Um, so I'll go to the videos. Uh, so first of all, of, of, the, of the device holder. This is what the device holder looks like. Um, as you can see, we've got four slots for devices. Well, I think we're still seeing your PowerPoint. We've also got uh, okay. not the video. You might need to unshare and then you share or share your screen. 
Fuck will be back. You. Yeah, that's looking good. This is what the device holder looks like. Um, as you can see, we've got four slots for devices. Um, and we've also got a little silicon diode here, uh, which can be used to sort of track the intensity of the light source over time. So if we were to use this, um, this device holder, we would place our, our solar cells uh, face down into the holder. So, and once they are in the holder, we, we have to place this lid on top, which as you can see has these holes in it, which is the mask, um, which aligns um, with the, the, the metal area on, on the device. <clears throat> this gives us a nice defined um, active area of our devices. Now to, to push this down a bit and give a good electrical connection, we have to put this metal lid on top. And then we could use these, uh, these bolts, these knobs to, to tighten the chamber and push this down. Um, now if you were to measure um, your devices under the nitrogen atmosphere, um, I mean, typically you, you probably won't need to do this because the devices are encapsulated. But if you if you want to have some extra protection for your device during measurements, <clears throat> you could connect a nitrogen line here to the side. Um, this is a five mil um, Festo connector. Um, so you can connect your, your nitrogen line. Um, then we have this, this quartz window here, which fits into the little device holder. And we can then place this on top here. Um, and again, you would then um, secure this with, with these knobs. All right, so that's the device holder. Now I'll, I'll explain about the, the multiplexer. This is one of the, the multiplexers that we use to measure our devices. Um, each multiplexer can measure uh, up to seven pixels simultaneously. Um, the, the total current limit of, of this multiplex is 35 milliamps, which means about five milliamps um, per channel, uh, which is more than enough for, for devices we use at the moment. Um, each of these multiplexes is very similar to to the Keatleys you were using before, um, except probably a bit, a bit less uh, sensitive, but uh, perfectly capable of doing the measurements that we want to do. Uh, so basically the, the way it works is that um, when you do, for example, a, a voltage scan, is that each pixel um, will undergo this, this voltage scan, but the data will only be collected for one pixel at a time. It sort of scans through each pixel from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then back to one. Um, and, and you can see here is where uh, we connect the, um, the multiplexer with a ribbon cable to the device holder. And on the other side, um, there's a connection here uh, for a cable to connect with a uh, USB port. Okay, so we'll send five of these multiplexes to go with your setup so you can measure all those four devices which have 32 pixels in total and all simultaneously. Um, so the next step is, is connecting all this together um, also to the, the laptop which we'll send to you as well, which, uh, which will have all the code on it as well. So now we can actually uh, connect our device holder um, to the multiplexer, which will then uh, connect to a PC or, or in your case, a laptop. Um, so if you start with a device holder, you can see that there's uh, an inlet here uh, for, for this plug. Um, so you have to push it in quite hard until basically it doesn't move it any further. Um, and then you can see that each multiplexer here has 
um, output for, for one of these Revit cables. Um, so I'll just show you one for now. So you just plug the Revit cable in there, and then the other side uh, goes here to the multiplexer. Just like that. And then the other side of the multiplexer, there's this connection for the USB cable. Um, and because we, we will have five of these multiplexes, um, and the laptop only has um, two or three USB ports, we'll have to use this, this USB hub. Um, it's got connections for seven um, USB devices. So we just push that in there. Um, and then in turn, we can use this cable to um, connect this USB hub. to the computer. Okay, so now we're all, all set to begin our measurements. Okay, so next I'll, I'll introduce the software. Okay, so the software we use is, is some Python code that was written by, by one of our colleagues here, Kang Yu. Um, and it's all in, in the form of multi-pixel testing, which you'll find on the desktop of your laptop. Open that, you'll see there's quite a few files in here, but really the only thing uh, you need to um, worry about are JV parameter.json, um, where you can change your, your parameters, and multi-pvrig.bat, which actually runs the program. Um, and then outputs is where, um, where your data will be um, printed to. Um, so first of all, what you always have to do is a calibration measurement. Um, so you can see this basically is a notepad, um, <clears throat> a notepad file. Um, so first, what we want to do um, is put in an experiment name. So I'm just using test for the moment. Um, you can use either um, cyclic or constant here. So a cyclic will just be a, a current voltage scan. Um, and constant, we can basically put in a, a fixed voltage and uh, have it run at that voltage for a set amount of time. Um, something else you'll want to put in is device area. Um, so the ones, uh, the pixels we have are 9.5 square millimeter. And the current range, you don't need to worry about that. So the sample rate is roughly how many times per second we collect the data point. 100 is, is good for, uh, for these, these current voltage scans, and you probably want to use about 10 if you are doing a uh, voltage um, MPP run. Okay, so the, the next thing I'll show is how to, to calibrate these multiplexes because they, they do have a small current offset. Here's where you can change the, the measuring parameters. So if you've chosen cyclic, um, you have to put in a, a voltage minimum. So it's roughly where um, the, the scan starts at what voltage. Volt max is up to what voltage it measures. Uh, volt per second is sort of the, the scan speed. Um, and number of cycles, you'll it's a, just want to leave that at one. So basically how many of these measurements it, it runs in succession. Now, if you put in constant, um, you, can, you can measure the stability here, uh, put in the voltage and the duration in seconds. Um, now, before we want to do this, um, we'll need to do some calibration because each of the multiplexes has a, a, a leakage current, which is non-zero. Um, and if we first do run a calibration, uh, we can then sub, the, the program will then subtract um, this this leakage current from the measurement. So we just change this to one, uh, and we uh, we save these parameters, and then we exit, and then we we run the the multi PV on that program. Um, so you know, it opens up five uh, five script script prompts, and you might be able 
to see here there's some, some red lamps flashing signify that the multiplexes are working okay so that's that done and then if you look into output you can see that there's the um, the data files right there okay so next i'll, I'll show how to do uh, a jv scan Uh, I think the sound has become a bit muffled. Sorry, Sam. I think the, the sound was a bit muffled in this last video. Yeah, it's because the uh, for this one the the lamps are on for the. For okay. The, ah, sorry. Yeah, this is one of the reasons why I, why I pre-recorded these uh, these videos to try and minimize that. So carry on. I didn't know if it was just yeah. a Zoom thing. Yeah, so the, the last video is, is how to do a, a maximum PowerPoint uh, measurement. Yeah, so that um, is it. So I see there's some some questions in the chat already.
Okay. Um, does anyone have a question about the setup? Okay, so as, as you can see, it's it's all here now. So I'll, I'll try to ship this uh, in the coming week or so, and then we'll be able to start measuring. Uh, Amara. Maybe it's about the software. Is it uh, a kind of platform independent or I don't know? Does it work on every types of Windows? Yeah, so it's just a Python program. Um, you know, we can just uh, okay, it's Python. They can transfer it in between between PCs, and it seems to work fine like that. Uh, well, the the code is all available as well. So if you know, in future someone wants to change something or or add something onto it, then then that's also possible. I suppose that all the testing stuff is compatible with outdoor testing too, isn't it? So in principle, all this could be used outdoors or or indoors on the new light source that's coming as well. And and, it, and the, it's on a laptop, so you could move that around. Yeah, and hopefully you won't be bothered by power cuts. Yeah. Your measurements. Okay, so if, if there's no other questions and I just want to thank you all for for attending and, and I hope you you learned something today um, yeah that's it from my side thank you Bob thanks for putting all that together and yeah like okay that hopefully was useful and obviously we can follow up follow up offline on, on these things and as as the things arrive we can do more hands-on demos and training and discussions to make sure everything's up and running as it should be. I can have a very quick update on the power trans part. I just uh, very quickly uh, share something. Uh, so we have, um, by the way, thank, thank you Brad for the, all this uh, workshop and I learned quite a lot and uh, very impressive the whole it, it, setup we made. So uh, we have this board uh, we made here. And as you can see, the panel is here. We test this with the real panel. And the pump is here. As my student gave me this uh, yesterday. So the pump, we, well, we, we use this pump as kind of just demo. So um, uh, that is a uh, um, built in to actually DC motor with this connection. So the connection connect to the, uh, the board here for the main power. And the board also provide uh, a five volt USB for some electronic charging that's just kind of multifunctional inputs here connect to the solar panels cable. So then we have the entire system. Very quickly show you that um, uh, some of this, the function of the board. So, um, so that's the board we have. Um, where we have the uh, uh, a CPIC circuit for uh, for doing the main power. So the main power for the pump is uh, is from this, uh, uh, this 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 plug, and we have the built-in uh, maximum power power uh, point tracking control uh, using this Raspberry Pi controller. Uh, so so the whole board. Uh, automatically tracks the maximum power of the panel to um, to give the so, so at the moment that we set always tracks the maximum power to have the maximum uh, pumping power for the uh, for the pump for the water pump uh, but you can set different um, mission profile or load um, as you wish and we also have the uh, uh, the five volt output for the USB so. Um, uh, you can always charge some electronics if you want. So kind of one board for both functions. And we have some built-in soft start protections just in case um, uh, some uh, inrush current or some um, uh, uh, capacitor charging current uh, to damage the board. So the good thing for the whole board is it doesn't need any um, uh, heat sink. So uh, the efficiency is reasonably high and also we use uh, quite good power MOSFETs and dials to 
uh, minimize the, uh, uh, the heat generation, also to dissipate the heat uh, if, if, if we have any. So the board is actually quite, uh, I'm just back to, uh, to say, so the, the board is actually quite thin, so it, it can be mounted uh, at the back side of the panel. It's actually a very small board. And the, uh, um, even in the future, if we have the, um, the uh, power sky uh, uh, solar cell, it, it, I mean, this can also be part of it. So it's, it's actually quite small. We can even further reduce the size, but you know, we're saying it's not maybe not necessarily at the point. And also very cheap. So that slide I'm going to share uh, later has the whole bond cost of this uh, board. It's, it's, it's very cheap board and quite easy to make. Yeah, so uh, we can send the, uh, the, well, we send the board to uh, to the Ethiopian partners, well, but we, we also send the whole design files, uh, PCB uh, files, and, uh, and all the, um, uh, the uh, program we made uh, for this control. So I think the better we send all design files. So, I mean, they can, uh, well, you can uh, modify and, uh, do some revision or simulation. It's also part of the, uh, uh, the further research. So yeah, so just very very quick that that uh, system level of demonstration. So we can at the moment uh, use the whole site tap to do some water pumping. Uh, I mean outside, we did some some something last week, and it it, it, it works pretty well. And uh, uh, we now we we're doing some further uh, improvement, especially. Uh, one thing we found out could possibly be a problem uh, is when we have this pump in the water, uh, it has a load, so that's fine. But if we assume we have some kind of sudden, uh, well, like, like you, if you lift that pump very, very quickly out of the water, that could have some uh, um, uh, kind of step change of the load and that, that cause some kind of uh, problem of the, or it will not damage it, it just, trip that and you have to restart again but that's quite a euro situation normally you you, you put the, the, the pump quicker than you lift it right because that's 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 reasonably heavy so uh, uh but we will uh, implement that further protection so yeah so very very quick kind of oral um report of the progress here at the power that's great thing yeah fantastic thank you yeah so if you want to sh sh ship it now you can try with um, about to go. Uh, we, we ship that board. Uh, that's I mean that's quite uh, quite simple. Um, but we, I, I mean, I think maybe better is like we we ship at the same time and we give the whole design files and we can give the supplier which is the GC uh, GLC PCB. They make all the board for and these they have uh, distribution uh, worldwide, so um, they can make more uh, replicas of this. Support. I think that may be easier because, to be honest, you know, um, we we expect going to blow up some of the boards because, yeah. you know, especially for the power part, it's quite easy to blow up things. So it's better to have more boards uh, um, just 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 in case. So we're going to send all the uh, design files, which should be okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Very nice work. Um, yeah, I think with that we've we've come to the end. So I'll stop the recording.